Hello and welcome to Backyard Farmer. Thank you so much for joining us for another hour of good gardening. We've got a really great show planned for you tonight and we're awfully anxious to get to your gardening questions. So you can just give us a call at 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Toll free number is 800-676-5446. Emails and pictures, send those to byf at unl.edu. We answer them on a future show and please give us as much information as you can, including where you live, no stalking goes on. <laughs> So don't forget to follow Backyard Farmer during the week also. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest, all that good social marketing and media stuff. All right, Jonathan Larson, you start with your sample. Okay. I didn't bring any actual bugs this time. I, I, hope, I, know, I hope you're not disappointed. I brought some insect repellents with me today. We're entering mosquito season. We're going to start having lots of biting pests out as they transfer disease like West Nile virus and Zika virus. We're worried about mosquitoes. And so a lot of people want to keep them off of them. If you really want to reduce mosquito populations on your property, you want to dump out containers that fill up with water on a regular basis, maybe every two days or so, and treat standing bodies of water with BT mosquito dunks. But to keep them off of you, you want some repellents. And you want one that contains DEET, oil of lemon eucalyptus, or picaridin. These are the three ones that we know work really well. There's a couple of others that we have some good data for, but you want to avoid things like essential oils or citronella or those rubber bands that you can buy that are supposed to repel mosquitoes. These are the three kinds that we know are efficacious. So look for these at your local grocery store or hardware store. So I would think the rubber band you could just like. Yeah, you might flick it at the mosquitoes yeah. and get a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Jonathan. All right, Matt Soshik, your first appearance of the season with a weapon and some small, tiny little yes. things. Yes, so not only do we have mosquitoes coming out, but we also have uh, a lot of little weeds. So I brought some test tube baby weeds in and just uh, to get some differences between the, the little emerging plants we have here. Uh, large crabgrass is the one I'm pointing out right now and that's been coming up for the last month, but is the weather's been cold and hot. Uh, it's emerging newly all the time. Uh, so some telltale signs between this one and some of the other ones is that the leaves are hairy on both sides. They have very fine hairs on them. So if you get down and look closely, uh, you'll see these, these furry little leaves. Um, and that'll kind of tell you that it's large crabgrass. Um, and then the next one here that's right next to it, if you can see in here, it's a kind of a small grass. Uh, looking similar to, to the large crabgrass, but this one's goosegrass. And generally it emerges uh, two to four weeks after large crabgrass, uh, but the leaves are a little bit more oval and they have kind of a parallel venation uh, on the leaves and they have no hair on them. So that'd be one way of telling you know, which weed you have if, if you have large crabgrass with the, with the hairs on it. Uh, and then this one, goosegrass, uh, no hairs on it, and it's going to be a little bit more prostrate growth, like uh, spreading out on the ground versus crabgrass will be more uh, erect growth. Um, so there's different products to control these two, so you want to make sure that you know what the weed is before you're treating it. And then the next two here, you can kind of look at them. If you're looking from a distance, um, they look like pretty much the same thing if you're not looking too closely. Uh, this one's yellow nuts edge, and that one's been coming up uh, pretty readily over the last two weeks, especially when we had those 90 degree temperatures. Uh, and then the next one is yellow foxtail. And one way to tell this one is it kind of has a red base on it, and also it has some long, uh, long hairs along the top side of the leaf. So these are just, you know, three, four, four different grasses, one sedge, uh, but the sedge can uh, commonly be confused with the grassy weed. And then lastly over here, uh, purslane, which is a summer annual, and this one's starting to come up also. And uh, it's just good to know that if you go and look now, uh, it'll be a little bit easier to control these weeds. If you wait another month, these are going to be no, no longer babies. They're going to be adults, and they're going to be really hard to control. So, so get them early, get them while they're young. So as opposed to people, adult, adult grasses are harder than baby people. Yes, <laughs> it's the exact opposite. <laughs> All right, Amy, you have a real piece of ugliness there. I do have some ugliness today. I am, um, somebody brought this into my office and this is a rose and he said this is a rose that, his, that he's been trying to save. It was his grandmother's rose. So we're looking at an heirloom type rose, most likely 
<clears throat> maybe like at Harrison Rose. But he says in multiple years he gets death of the canes and he gets this dark black discoloration associated with it. And what this is, this is actually a fungal canker. It's a little different once I start looking into it a little bit than canker caused by black spot, which is also a fungus. This is another species of fungus, um, but it can be pretty prolific um, in attacking those canes. And if you take a look at it, all this black is actually sporulation that is occurring. On some of the spots, you can actually see where the outside tissue of that stem is actually broken open, like you would see on a tree. So how do we manage this? This is a great time, uh, you know, for me up in northern Nebraska, we're, we're just starting to look at our roses. This is the time when we start pruning them out. So we're seeing what growth we have coming back, what didn't get killed by the winter. And we're gonna wanna prune these out because this is gonna provide inoculum for the remainder of the season. So cut it back until you don't see any black, gross, disgusted nastiness on your, on your uh, <laughs> rose canes and anything that's dead. And how do we treat this next, this coming fall? We're gonna be looking at those fungicide applications like we do for black spot. And we're gonna make those applications according to the label, whether it's 14, 21, or 28 days. And that should protect you um, from getting this fungal canker development on this rose again next year. So, and the trick is with it being an heirloom, we don't have any resistance. So you're gonna to have to look at those fungicide applications. All right, excellent, thanks, Amy. All right, Elizabeth, that's sort of a sadness too. <laughs> it's so cute. Um, what I have here is rhubarb. And if this rhubarb was a newly planted crown, we'd be like, that is awesome. It's doing great. It's doing really well. The stalks, are, you know, it's got some growth to it. Unfortunately, this is a 50 year old plant. So it's a well established plant. At this point in time, we should have stalks that are bigger than your thumb and leaves bigger than your hand at this point in time. So unfortunately with this rhubarb, we've got some issues and we're probably looking at it starting to age itself out. Um, we probably need to go in and divide that crown. We need to make sure that we fertilize it. The client that brought this in, it started last year, so they didn't pick from it. They fertilized it, then they let it harden off as we got into the, the summer months and into the fall months, and then they made sure it had adequate moisture, hoping that this spring it would snap out of it. Well, unfortunately, this spring it did not snap out of it. Um, so we could be looking at, they may need to rejuvenate that bed. Um, we actually have a sample at the plant pest and diagnostic lab to make sure we don't have anything pathological, that it is an environmental condition going on. Um, and then, like I said, you might be rejuvenating, trying some new crowns and, and maybe even possibly starting over with some of this plant. So what's old is new again, maybe. Po hopefully <laughs> to, to save it. All right, Good thanks trend. guys and Elizabeth. <laughs> All right, Jonathan, you get the first picture question. Um, this is a viewer who said last year they had Japanese beetles, uh -huh. skeletonized plants. Oh. They show pictures of their climbing rows and they wanna know if this is a Japanese beetle larva. Okay, this is a twofer. I get to talk about two bugs then. Yes, you do. <laughs> so here in the image, we have a rose slug and the rose slug is really a very confusingly named insect. It's called a rose slug it turns into an adult sawfly, but they're actually wasps. So this is a baby <laughs> wasp that lives on the rose and it feeds on the upper and lower portions of the surface of the leaf. And it sort of creates that brown papery damage that you see behind the, the baby there. And after they get bigger, they start chewing all the way through and then they get through the whole leaf and it looks a lot like Japanese beetle damage. So despite looking like a caterpillar, it's actually a baby wasp. So the best product to control it at this point would be spinosad. If you catch it earlier in the season, simply pruning them off the plant or picking them off and destroying them with your bare hands for retribution <laughs> is a potential control strategy. Since you deal with Japanese beetle, you said, uh, you may wanna start looking out for those in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we're gonna start seeing them emerge, I think, because we're kinda two weeks ahead of schedule on a lot of bugs. So you may wanna prepare for them here in the near future by either preparing a soapy bucket so you can dump those beetles in there and kill them, or you can try and spray the leaves later on in the season with neem or pyola when the beetles emerge. Those are two organic products that last five to seven days on the leaf, provide really excellent protection. You will have to reapply as the season goes on though. Excellent. I like the uh, graphics. Squish <laughs> <laughs> <Squish 'em. laughs> All right, Matt, uh, simple question. What is this taking over the yard in North Bend? 
All right. So at first, yeah, this is a tough one, but when you see those seed heads on there, mm -hmm. it's kind of a telltale sign that uh, after looking at maybe the stem also, you can kind of tell that it's triangular. So it's a type of sedge. And the closest one that I could find just from the looks of these pictures would be oval leaf sedge. Um, and it's a perennial and it spreads by seed. So you can see right now that it's, um, the seed is ready to be pollinated. So that you want to control it now, probably either mow it off, or if it's an area that's not in the lawn, spray it with Roundup so that it, it doesn't produce all those seeds, or just grab them, like Jonathan says, and <laughs> rip them out of the ground. Um, but uh, since it is in the sedge family, if it is in the lawn, you could also use some of the products that work on uh, yellow nut sedge. So that would be uh, Halo Sulfuron or Sulfentrazone. Um, those would be two products, or the actives in the products that would work on controlling those, I would assume, since it's a sedge. Perfect, or you just let the sedge become a part of your lawn. Yes, you but, could do that too. All right, Amy, um, this is our first pear question of the season, and it's actually a Bartlett. So he says it's on all the new growth, um, not on the apples and peaches. He has used a copper fungicide every two weeks starting in April. He's wondering, how to prevent it and will the fruit still be good to eat? So I took a lot of time looking at this picture trying to make sure it wasn't bacterial like fire blight and to me it is not fire blight. It most likely is a fungal leaf spot. You have been treating every two weeks with a copper product which should protect us. The trick is we have been getting rains and the copper product is 100% contact. So it is only on the leaf and only on the fruit until we have a rain event and then it washes off. And so there's a good potential that between your sprays, we had a rain event, it washed the product off and it became an opportunity for that fungus to move in. Um, without throwing it underneath the microscope, I can't tell you which leaf spot it is. Uh, most likely the fruit should be good, good to go. Um, there is pear scab that we will see. I typically don't see it on the leaves, but I wouldn't be too concerned. I would continue with that spray schedule uh, that you've been doing. But as we get more weather events, and if you're really concerned about it, sometimes we have to bump up those copper product applications to adjust to that. All right, thank you, Amy. Okay, this is a, is this a ground cover or is this a weed question, Elizabeth? Um, and this is a hillside in Beatrice. She says it's covered with this, and she wants to know what it is, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, because she also has crown vetch. She wants the crown vetch, she does not want this. So we did some looking, because it's one of those weeds where, yes, I've seen it before, couldn't put my name on it. So um, what it is, is it's a weed, it's called Rough Avens, A-V-E-N-S, um, GM Liciniatum. And what it is, is it has a little tiny white flower and then the little tiny white flower is followed by this seed head that has lots of tiny burrs. And those little tiny burrs get stuck in your sock and stuck on the dog. So if you have a pet or you don't wanna walk around and try to pick those things out of your sock, you can go ahead and remove them. Um, it is one of the, the native plants that's out there, so you could leave it, but if you want to get, to get rid of it, you could <coughs> rip it out. Um, use your bare hands. No. <laughs> We're all you about could, physical control. <laughs> uh, you could pull it out if you chose, because I know you want, they want to keep the crown veg. Or they could do the glove of death method, where you put on the rubber glove, you put on the cotton glove, and then you spray that non-selective glyphosate herbicide over the top and rub it directly on those plants that you want to get rid of them. Um, those are a couple of ways that you could. Uh, it's holding the slope, so you might as well, you know, if you don't walk out there, just go ahead and leave it. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Well, downtown Lincoln has undergone a real transformation in the past few years. Parks and Rec Department has done a fantastic job with containers and a lot of their other plantings. With the help from the Young Professionals of Lincoln Group, this season's containers were planted with some old reliables and some beautiful new and exciting ornamentals.
Well, we're part of Union Bank's Young Professionals Group, which is affiliated with Lincoln's Young Professional Group. Um, each year we have different events that we do internally for our employees, and two of them are philanthropic events. Today we will be planting flowers and different various plants in the potters around the park and then also around the trees. So today we're at Union Plaza getting ready to do the annual plantings of the planters. Uh, this year's combinations include both hot and cool colors and we try to mix them up with some perennials that have lasted for three or four years so far. So to supplement the planters with the existing perennials, we add the colorful annuals to keep the season interest going. So this year we're trying some plants we haven't used before. Um, in front of me I have Starry Night Petunia and it's interesting because of the white spots in the dark blue purple flowers. We're using a straw flower, this one's called Jumbo Yellow Straw Flower. It's a tough plant, uh, it brings a lot of brightness to your planter and the third plant this year that we've not tried is its golf ball Crispedia. And what's interesting about this particular plant is it gets a stalk and it has a round, almost allium looking ball on the end that will be a color of yellow. So as you notice, these are all going in different pots, but all of the combinations work together. Um, and we're really focusing on using purples, yellows, oranges, and we always add in grass for texture or a cordyline just for some uh, architectural interest in the planters. So this is one that we've been committed to for the last three years ever since Parks and Rec um, approached us and asked us to help out. Um, one of the reasons behind that is because Union Bank um, contributed a significant donation towards the creation of this park um, and so we want to do our part to keep it beautiful and maintain it. Thanks to Lincoln Parks and Rec and the UBT Young Professionals of Lincoln for making our community beautiful. And they had some other people there besides Union Bank, but they were really well represented. And that was a lot of fun mm -hmm. to schlep that all around. It was also really hot. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you get the next picture, Jonathan. Uh, and this is one you might pop back to Amy. This is a Blair viewer, has a Canada red cherry, three years old, okay. leaves are quickly riddled by this time of year, and they're nearly, nearly all gone by the end of the summer. Okay. Well, when I looked at this at first, I was trying to figure out if we had maybe a cherry slug, which is just like the rose slug that we talked about a moment ago, and or earwigs, things like that. They may chew on cherry leaves, but the longer I thought about it and the more people I talked to, the more I became convinced that this is in Amy's realm, that this is a fungus of some sort, this right, Amy? This is a fungus. Well, I told Jonathan it could be uh, leaf cutter bees already out uh, there. Yes, yeah, possible. <laughs> because they're perfectly <clears throat> round holes. It's a fungal disease, and it's called shuttle. Mm -hmm. Because it looks like you took a shotgun underneath and just went boom, and those are the slugs that went through it. Perfectly round. It's a fungal disease. Um, it starts out with a darker brown. As the disease progresses, it turns a light, papery brown. And with that dead tissue, it just falls out. And so the cool, wet weather is really promoting this right now. Management, you know, most of the time I don't recommend a fungicide application. If you're seeing some major defoliation of the tree and, and it's not as winter hardy, you would want to come in with a fungicide application. Um, you'd have to check the products and how often you would have to spray it. So, all right, thanks guys. Okay, Matt. Um, <laughs> this is a, a person who says, can't tell if it's a weed or a flower, and we get this a lot about this weed. They planted something, but they're not sure this is it. I'm gonna go ahead and say that's probably not it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty positive that that's poison hemlock. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty common, you know, in pastures or even along ditches where it's wet, and it'll have a hollow stem. Mm -hmm. um, so one way to get rid of those if you don't have very many of them would be just to dig them out. And you want to get deep because they have a tap root. So if you just cut them off at the top, they'll regrow. So make sure you get it deep enough to pull the whole plant out and get right. rid of it. And we were talking off air that they are already almost yes. flowering yes. and six the, feet tall in some spots. They grow quick, especially when you have 90 degree temps. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Amy, this is an interesting one. This is a, a, a viewer who has a tree, she lives in Beaver Crossing, tree has a giant hole in it. Looks like they lined the hole with black tar before they bought the house. Um, looks healthy, but the hole is collecting water. And then of course, you can see the rot going on there 
in the middle of it. So what should they be doing here? There is a lot of rot going on. Step number one, never ever <laughs> treat a hole or a stump or a broken bryant with tar or paint or anything like that. All you do is you trap moisture and you trap those fungal pathogens that cause those rots and the decline of your tree is a lot faster. So what can we do about this? Oh, number two, do not put cement in it because we have seen that too. Yeah. Put it with soil and plant some plants. Plant some plants. That is perfect. After you cut off the top of the tree. Um, at this point in time, there isn't anything you can really do for the tree. The one thing you're seeing that rock continue, if you're seeing sawdust at the bottom, this would be a Jonathan, but we're going to be looking at carpenter ants being very active, which also reduces the integrity of that tree. So with how big it is, I would probably really start considering replacing that tree. You know, you can be like Jonathan and rip the whole thing out, but <laughs> maybe cut it down a little bit, but I would really consider replacing that tree. Um, it's not gonna survive much longer and it's actually almost becoming a um, personal property threat because of how deep that hole is. Right, all right, thanks Amy. All right, Elizabeth, you have two unrelated species but related problems. And uh, the first one here is a, a cherry tree, five years old. This is a Bellevue viewer. Vertical cracks in the trunk all the way around. Blooming appears to be healthy. And then the second one is uh, an Omaha viewer who overwintered a concolor fir in her garage. Bottom looks a little rough and a big old crack at the bottom. So she's wondering if she should say thanks for spending the winter in the garage and start over. <laughs> Um, especially with that con color, say thanks, but no thanks, it's time for you to go. Um, it's not gonna come back more than likely and you're gonna always have that damage there. Same with that cherry. Um, we've seen a lot of damage on the trunks of the trees and anytime we see more than one third of the trunk that's affected and the bark is plating and peeling off, um, that tree's not able to move water and nutrients in that portion. And so we saw it with the ornamental pears, we saw it with some crab apples, we saw some bark blasting where the sap wasn't out of the tree when we dropped below freezing. And what happens is, is that tree will use its energy reserves up. Once that energy reserve has been used up, then we start to see it start to fail. So there is a possibility with that cherry that we're gonna see it bloom normal, leaf out, and then it's gonna drop its leaves earlier than normal and start to decline. So unfortunately with both of those trees, we're probably gonna have an opportunity to try something different in those locations eventually. Excellent, you'll notice how we always say, viewers, opportunity. opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, you know, it has been just a tad wet this week, but that did not stop our master gardeners from getting our garden planted. Let's take a minute to visit the Backyard Farmer Garden with Extension Educator, Terry James. in the backyard farmer garden we've been fighting the rain rain all across the state has probably slowed down getting your garden planted but as you can see our garden is almost all planted we're very excited about the new all america selections that we have and all summer long we'll be talking about each one individually and telling you our report of what they're doing in our garden but as you can see we've got our garden planted we have flowers and vegetables combined so we're going to have a very col colorful garden one of the things that we've done is made sure that we have plenty of room for our tomatoes. Our tomatoes are supported. They were a little long, so we had to do a little special planting for them. We had to dig a deeper hole and plant them a little farther in the ground, so we had a good root system to get those tomatoes started. So stop by our backyard farmer garden soon to see all our tomatoes and see how well they're growing. You know, it really looks great already and we're awfully excited to see how it turns out this year because we're off to such a fabulous start. Thanks to those master gardeners. Without them, nada. All right, Jonathan, a question from Lincoln about bean beetle. Okay. Uh, last year, apparently, they got the beans and this, <laughs> the viewer did not. Got bupkis. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess I would have a question about which bean beetle you're referring to. We've got Mexican bean beetles. We've got Colorado potato beetle that can get on beans. Lots of different kinds of bean beetles out there. Uh, for a lot of them, you could probably try a, a neem or a spinosad if you wanted an organic product. A seven control option with uh, carbaryl insecticide might work. 
or biological control. If it's a Mexican bean beetle, there are some biocontrol options you can purchase off the internet. But I would want some more information before pushing you on any of those paths. So look me up at the Omaha Extension Office and we can figure out what you're dealing with. Excellent, thank you, Jonathan. All right, Matt, uh, this is a pasture, so I'm assuming there is grass in it. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> but apparently it's also two acres worth of mulberries. So how, how do they get rid of the mulberry tree slash shrubs in, in the grasses? All right, so anytime you have well, a pasture, mulberries, any type of trees, um, there's products that contain either triclopyr or uh, picloram, which is tordon. So it'd be like a grazon product. It's a combination of 2,4-D and picloram. Uh, and that, that product actually works quite well at the higher rates in controlling a lot of those uh, trees that are coming up in the pasture. And uh, one thing with that, I think it is labeled as a restricted use product. So you have to have a pesticide license in order to apply it. Uh, there might be some others that would work with the trichop here that you don't need, maybe, maybe not. I don't know, but uh, Grazon's going to be your yeah. Best Grazon would be the be readily easiest, available. and that's what I would recommend. And if you don't don't find Grazon P and D, it's also a product called Grassland. It's also a Dow yes. product. Yeah. So the multi-talent of all the people <laughs> in the chair. Yeah, gen generics. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, Amy. Um, we had a question last week about rust on hollyhocks and getting, and mm -hmm. we're actually getting rid of the hollyhocks. This one is, will the rust that hollyhocks get spread to other plants in the garden or to ground covers? No, um, it's very specific to hollyhocks. And I actually went online just to double check again because I heard the question from last week. Um, there is no alternate host. And so for it to complete its life cycle, currently we don't know what other plants it goes to. So as far as we know, it does not go to any other plants in your landscape, only hollyhocks. Awesome, that's excellent and unusual. Mm -hmm. That's very unusual. All right, Elizabeth from Ord. Asparagus in the garden is in full sun, um, third year. Some shoots are big enough to harvest, others are teensy. So should he cut back the smaller shoots or harvest the big ones? I would selectively pick the big ones and eat it. Um, depends on who you talk to. Some of the companies that sell the asparagus crowns tell you to wait three years. Um, some people tell you to wait the first year, pick lightly the second year, and third year pick as normal. Um, so I would selectively pick a few of the big spears so at least you can ha say that you had some of your own asparagus. And then I'd let the small ones go ahead and fern out and then with time go ahead and let the rest of that fern out so that way you've put more energy into the crown for next year. Excellent, all right, thank you, Elizabeth. We have a Seward viewer who has an Arborvita about four feet tall with two main trunks coming right from the base. Do they lop one off or do they keep them both? Keep them both, otherwise you're gonna have half a tree. All right. We have a Malcolm viewer who has a lilac and apparently does not want it to spread. Is there any way to keep an old fashioned lilac from suckering? You can dig up the suckers. <laughs> All right, do we have you, uh, do yous have growth inhibitors in them like walnuts? We have somebody who tore them out and wants to plant annuals. Nope, go ahead as long as annuals are made for that, spot, that site. All right, what does the term full sun actually mean? Full sun with vegetables is ideally we'd like to have six to eight hours of direct sun a day. All right, so if that's what full sun is, what do we mean by part shade? Less than that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cheating. All right, how do you kill strawberries that are creeping into a landscape bed without um, causing harm to dogs? Most of the products on the market are usually safe once they're dry. So you, you could use a glyphosate product like Roundup, or if you really wanted to, you could solarize that area. However, that clear plastic down and have the dogs run over, it's not gonna work out real well. <laughs> All right, thank you, Elizabeth. You ready, Amy? Yeah. Still. Okay, so we are still seeing those orange goo wads on the junipers. How much longer can we expect to get that question? <laughs> Once the rain stops and we get to warmer temperatures. So you have to ask um, Al Dutcher that question. All right. <clears throat> Does this wet weather favor anthracnose in oak? I think that was a problem last year. It definitely does. Uh, oaks, sycamores, all those trees are gonna be very susceptible to anthracnose this year, but we don't recommend treatment for it. All right. Um, this viewer lost a, a big branch on one of their maples and saw some st 
streaking in the wood, is that a sign of versillium or any way to know? It's really hard to know. Um, the streaking could also be an indication of heart rot starting. Um, and depending on if they cut it off, it could just also be some black streaks from the chainsaw blade. All right. Would botrytis show up in peonies now as blackened edges on the petals, or is that not how it oh, displays? Yeah, we're, we're heavy botrytis right now on peonies. If you want to protect them, you need to get your fungicide applications on now. All right, nice job. Come on. <laughs> Awfully quiet Ready? now. Ready? Oh, it's it's in. It's in. It's centered. All right. So this viewer is saying, even though it's raining, they can't more, mow more often than one time a week. Is it really harmful if they're taking off like six inches of blade? Uh, at, at some point it is harmful, but if we're gonna keep getting these cool wet, wet days, it's gonna keep growing back. It's, if you can get out of, more often, it's better. All right, we have a viewer out in Sutton who says the hen bit appears as though it's blooming again in short turf. Is that true or is it something else? Could also be ground ivy. Okay, anything they do about that right now? Uh, yes, you can treat it. If it's hand bit, it's gonna die when it warms up, but you could use some products and probably knock it back to make it die quicker. Okay, so are we seeing also a second generation of some of those winter annuals or is it just delayed germination because of our odd temperatures? Uh, winter annuals would have been up already. So if we're having something else, it's probably a different type of weed rather than a winter annual, or you're just seeing them now, they're growing a little bit faster. Okay. Um, this viewer wants to know how soon after spraying with anamine can something be reseeded? Uh, 2,4-D amine. So that would probably be, I would say two weeks at least, maybe three, depending on what type of grass. Smaller seeded stuff is gonna be a little bit more sensitive to it. Excellent, nice job. I gotta beat six, that's the number. Yeah. You're not going to be six because I haven't written down seven questions. Oh, well, I'll just make one up. <laughs> so guess what? <laughs> All right. This particular Lincoln viewer saw green worms on her broccoli overnight. What is up with that and what are they? Could be looper caterpillars. They like crucifers, like those kinds of plants, and uh, they can open up and hide and then start eating and grow real quick. So what does this viewer do about that? Flick them off, pick them off, spray them off with a hose. At this point, I wouldn't recommend spraying with anything. All right, how can, how can you prevent that sunflower head moth that gets into cone flowers? Is there anything you can do about that? That's a tough one, because they get into that top part. Uh, you could try spraying the flower when the moths are flying, but you would need to put out a moth trap to, to monitor for that flight. All right, this is a lion's viewer who wants to know when to put down grub control in that area. You could start this month or next month. Okay. Um, are ant lions and immature ladybugs the same thing? They're not, they're two different species. All right, will the cold that we are predicting kill the ticks? No, ticks are tough. Like ticks, they, they, keep, they take a licking and keep on ticking. Say. So no, the cold won't take care of them. I think we ought to give him three points. <laughs> all right, nice job all. Oh, okay, Elizabeth, we have some plants of the week, one of which is not liking to be cut, at least the foliage, but the flowers are still nice. So what do we have this week? We'll start with the big purple ones because they're the real show stoppers at this point in time. These are the giant alliums or the giant onions. Uh, they are grown from a bulb. And so with these guys, what we want to do is we want to plant that bulb in the fall. And so they're tolerant of a wide range of things. They're tolerant of deer, um, rabbits, things like that. So that's the good news. Uh, full sun to three quarters shade, they, they run the gamut. They can be three to five foot tall and usually bloom in May and June. So right now they're in their full bloom. Once the blooms begin to fade, then we start to get the, the onion-like seed pods that are a little bit greener down there. Um, the one that doesn't like to be cut is our Chinese indigo. And that's kind of, to me, looks a little bit more pink compared to um, the giant allium. But this guy is starting to bloom now. It's supposed to bloom in June, which we're not quite there yet. But like Jonathan said, we are a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, two to three foot high, uh, full sun, or like this guy likes three quarters sh shade. So um, it's so tolerant of a wide range of um, to, of sites, including those um, that are alkaline, and then also it can handle a little bit of drought. And then the white one in front is the old standard 
mock orange. Um, so mock orange is really long lived, loves those tough sites. Awesome part is it's very sweetly smelling. So that's the good news about the mock orange is it smells very good just sitting here, um, but it is a good old fashioned shrub. So we got a wide range of plants this week um, from those that are from a bulb to the old standard shrubs. Awesome, thanks Elizabeth. And that Chinese indigo is in that container because Gladys is the first person who had one in Lincoln. Oh. And the person who put that in there just happened to find one of those shrubs. So thanks again to Gladys. Mm -hmm. All right, Jonathan, yes. you get picture number three. This is an Ashland viewer and they had a, a limb fall from their ash. Uh, didn't find any insects, didn't see any holes, a lot of dead in the tree itself. And they're wondering, is this how emerald ash borer damage manifests itself? Okay. No, it is not nearly this spectacular when it first begins. <laughs> so EAB, when it first starts in a tree, they do like the upper one third of the canopy, infesting that, that sort of fresh stuff at the top. And over the course of five to seven years, successive generations are gonna keep moving down the tree until they get to the trunk. Looking at this picture here in particular, if there were emerald ash borer in this tree, we would see lots of winding tunnels there where they're feeding. And we're just not seeing that in these pictures. So I would be, I'd feel very safe saying that you don't have EAB in this tree, but uh, lucky for you, mother nature has made a decision for you. Uh, you should probably not try to treat this tree. I would look up the Nebraska Forest Service 17 trees for 2017 and go ahead and have this ash taken down and pick out a new tree for your landscape. And it's probably sudden limb drop, mm -hmm. you know, the technical term for that, <laughs> um, where a limb just suddenly <clears throat> drops off. Why does ash do that? Though? Wind. <laughs> just, <laughs> some species are prone to it, and yeah. ash just happens to be one of them, where that limb just And it falls tricks off. people into thinking it's bugs. There you go. Bugs get blamed for everything. They do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Matt, um, speaking of trees, turf guy, this is, this is a Lincoln viewer and um, they have a failing seed, seedless cottonwood in their commons area, which is common. And, um, but this is really what's happening too, is those sprouts are coming up in the lawn and they wanna know how to get rid of the sprouts. They did say they painted them with Roundup and they keep coming back. Okay, so if, if your tree is dying but the sprouts are still coming up and you're treating them with Roundup, that's probably not what you want to do with any type of sucker, uh, especially with uh, glyphosate, um, which is a product that translocates throughout the plant. So it might have actually translocated to the, the mother plant, which would have been the tree. Uh, you might have you know, killed some suckers, but they'll keep coming back. Uh, a product that you could use would be glufosinate, which is a systemic product uh, that basically just kills, but it doesn't translocate into the plant or into the, the tree itself. Um, so you want to stay away from those brush killer products or picloram, which is toured on, uh, because that will actually translocate into the tree and kill it. So you want to stay away from those if you're just trying to kill the suckers. Uh, the best way to do that, though, is probably just prune them off early in the spring when they're shooting out, and then they really don't come back for the rest of the year uh, because they're putting all their energy into the leaves and top growth. So the suckers are usually taken care of if you just prune them. And those old seedless cottonwoods were a flash in the genetic pan. Yeah, they're not I, very good. I got anyway. a bunch, and they're all yeah. falling over with the wind. Yeah, <laughs> nothing like the good old big guy. Yeah. All right, um, Amy, we had we had this question earlier, but we didn't have <laughs> this much of it. Mm -hmm. This is a Diablo nine bark, and she it's a Northwest Iowa viewer. She says it's not been rainy and wet south side of a patio, but for heaven's sakes, it's more white than Diablo purple. So they actually have powdery mildew on, on the Diablo. So the unique thing about powdery mildew is it is a fungus. And typically we always tell you that fungi like a lot of rain, lots of moisture. Powdery mildew is kind of the opposite. It likes humidity. So even though you may not be getting the rain events, in general, um, Nebraska, Iowa has been very humid for this time of year. Um, we've had a lot of cloud cover, so we're not getting the evaporation off. So that's what's favoring it. Um, you're also going to see it on the north side a little bit more because it's not getting the sun penetration down in there. So how do you treat it? Uh, powdery mildew typically does not kill a plant. It will cause some premature defoliation. As we get 
warmer temperatures and humidity goes away, it will actually disappear. Uh, one way you can treat it is take a hose and blast it off a little bit. It helps, it helps um, slow it down a little bit. Um, you can do a fungicide application, but typically it's not necessary. Um, the other trick is you can look at uh, pruning it up a little bit to increase airflow in there so the foliage can dry off a little bit more um, from those humid environments. All right, thanks, Amy. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, uh, Elizabeth, this is uh, a viewer who has two 12-foot magnolias, 25 years old. Um, notice the curling leaves. She does say the lawn service sprayed <clears throat> a herbicide and it was, I believe, 992 is what she said the, yeah, whatever that is. And uh, she's wondering if it was rain, if it was herbicide damage, and will they bounce back from this? Um, based <clears throat> on the way that some of the leaves are really curled and some of the leaves are not curled, we're probably looking at herbicide injury. Um, with the magnolia, the answer <clears throat> is it depends. Um, it depends on how much herbicide drift it actually got, or volatilization is probably what happened. If we had some warm temperatures, they might have applied it when it was nice and cool out, and then we had some, some warm temperatures that made that product go and accidentally <coughs> ding some of that plant material nearby. It's just going to be a waiting game to see what happens with that plant. Uh, make sure that it has adequate moisture. Shoot for about an inch of supplemental moisture a week for those trees and sustain that throughout the non-rainy season, if we have that. Um, to make sure that that tree's in overall good health and then wait and see what happens um, come, come next year, how it leaves out. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Well, for our second feature tonight, we're going to look at a site renovation at a special place in Lincoln. Once again, Lincoln Parks and Rec and some wonderful volunteers came out to install new plants and give new life to the historic pioneer woman. With Backyard Farmer being 65 years old this year, we're doing some special segments on what is old is new again. I'm with Mark Canny, Parks and Recreation, and we are at the corner of 33rd and Sheridan, and there is some great big honkin' project going on here that is probably taking old things and restoring. So what is this, Mark? Absolutely, we're glad to have you here today at uh, what we're calling the Pioneer Restoration and Renovation Project. Pioneer Woman was a sculpture donated to the city by the Women's Club. Um, back in the 30s and uh, we recently undertook some renovations to upgrade her including the, some site work that we're doing today. Uh, we added a trellis that was historically there. Um, we've updated it from the wood to a metal structure that's kind of half circle in shape and we've added some walk loops around her. Um, today we're working with a group of volunteers to um, implement a sensory garden and as you know sensory gardens traditionally focus on the five senses, interesting textures, shapes, smells, colors. Um, but we're adding a little bit of a twist by trying to focus on pollinators and native plants in this sensory garden. So Mark, one of the other things that seems interesting about this is it's a, it's a rather formal design because the, the lilacs were there, right? It is. The lilacs historically have been there. They've been there since the 30s. So um, after some tree removal, we're trying to rejuvenate the lilacs, get them better light. And it really was more of a formal garden at one time with roses as kind of a key element. Uh, we're shifting directions a little bit. Um, we're using native plants and pollinator plants um, sort of in a formal setting in terms of the layout. We use a lot of color blocking because of ease of maintenance. Um, so it kind of combines the formalness of a garden using informal plants, I guess. It, and technically, this is really something that if, if a person in their own home landscape loves kind of the formal structure of a, a garden or a landscape, but they like a little bit more of the soft or the edgy of prairie plants, is, is this something they could look at once it gets established? Absolutely, we're, we're really doing this for the public. We like to think of, much like the university, we create these gardens as places to go, to learn, to discover what plants might work. Um, you know, this is a pretty open, rough setting. We are adding some irrigation just for our supplement, but it's really a trial garden in the sense of how do these plants that are both native and attractive to pollinators, how do they work together and how do they work in the landscape? So this is really fun, Mark, to, to actually look at this project that is taking what is old, making it new again. We're going to really look forward to coming back and seeing what it looks like after all these plants are in the ground. We'll, so we'll be excited to have you come back. Awesome. Thanks, Kim. Thanks. 
it'll be great to see that landscape mature over the years and see that transition between the formal and the informal landscapes. And we really are fortunate to be able to have these kinds of projects in our communities to show the value of public horticulture landscape systems. All right, so Jonathan, you get picture number four. And uh, this is a master gardener in Holdridge who brought an egg case from a praying mantis to our Minden show cool. live to tape and kept them in the house and 50 to 100 of the small little guys popped out of there. He took them out and sprinkled them. That's good. That's <laughs> very good. So talk about how many of them he can expect to actually live through well, the sprinkling. Uh, it won't be all of them. I mean, Mother Nature will take care of quite a few of them, birds and other things, and they do cannibalize each other quite a bit. There's not much that they can eat at this stage besides each other. So there's a lot of brothers and sisters munching down on each other with those <laughs> kung fu arms <laughs> that they have. Uh, after you could pray. After, exactly. Yes. They say their morning after. prayers. And, <laughs> Uh, and then eat. I would yeah. say then you, eat. you might see like four or five of them get to maturity in your right. in your landscape, and they'll be there eating lots of different kinds of stuff. But oh. that's a really cool find, and I'm glad you put them outside so that they didn't all die in that bag. Excellent. <laughs> Out of a hundred, four or five. Yeah, wow. yeah. That's why they have so many. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, speaking of many, Matt, this viewer says these are popping up all over the yard, and this is Holdridge. Uh, she spends time pulling, but they keep coming back and, and weed is winning. Yeah. Looks like to be onion family, doesn't smell like an onion. What is it and how do they control it? It is actually, the, the, that weed there with the flower is called the Star of Bethlehem. And it is uh, in the lily family, so it has those bulbs. And it, similar to those, there can also be like wild onion or wild garlic, and they kind of look similar. Uh, they'll be growing in March or April, and there'll be these tall green grass growing, kind of two bike structures. Uh, so what you can do then is uh, there's, you could dig them out. You'd want to get deep to get the bulbs out. Uh, that way they don't keep coming back. Just pulling them won't do it. Uh, and the other option would be 2,4-D, um, maybe with dicamba and sulfentrazone. There's been some studies done that look at uh, reapplying that, just spot spraying those, those uh, leaves that are coming up early in the spring multiple times. Yeah, and that is a tough one because yep. it's so pretty, people think it's supposed yeah. to be there. Yeah, and then you won't notice them once the lawn greens up because they're way ahead of the lawn usually. <laughs> All right, Amy, this is from uh, our good master gardener and extension person in Scott's Bluff. We have roses planted last year, look great this year, not so much. What do we think is going on here? So it looks like there's multiple things going on. So you can kind of see down at the base of the crown there, it looks like there's a little bit of canker development. It could be from black spot or the canker that I showed at the beginning of the show. Um, the other question I would have is, this is the one I wanted to talk about too. This one is actually an indication, you see how the top of the leaves are curling and how the nodes have gotten really short? This is an indication of herbicide drift injury. Um, the trick is the rose won't recover from this. Mm -hmm. um, so you're actually better off with this type of injury to go ahead and prune it. So then you'll get new cane development um, from, that point and off, from that point on. The other trick is it looks like there's a little bit of environmental injury going on, maybe a lack of water. Um, I know he stated that it's sprinkled with the lawn sprinkler. I get a little concerned when we have a lawn sprinkler sprinkling the flower beds. Are we getting enough water? Are we getting mm -hmm. adequate distribution patterns? If you want to continue using the lawn sprinkler, I would always suggest using the tuna cans just to see how much water are you actually getting. And those roses being stressed, they actually might need extra water than what you're actually getting from the turf. Because if you're managing the turf correctly, you shouldn't be putting that much water on. Um, so it may need some supplemental water. Um, dig down there, see how wet it is, and try the tuna cans also. All right, thank you, Amy. Elizabeth, we had a couple viewers ask us about this this year because it's really cool. Uh, and, you know, they don't know if it's an insect or a disease, but it's these pink things on their spruce. What is that? It's neither. It is a cone. Mm -hmm. So that's a spruce cone. They turn the female spruce cones or the purple ones, they're the ones that mature into the actual cones that then fall off of the tree. Um, the male cones are on there, they have their one job to release the pollen and then they drop off. Mm -hmm. um, but the female ones on the spruce are that bright purple and they're kind of fun. They're really kind of fun and a lot of them this year. Yep. 
Well, we always like to announce fun things going on in the gardening world, and we have a few of those. The first is the Greater Omaha Iris Society Annual Show, Saturday the 20th. We're hoping the, the storm didn't knock the iris out of commission for that particular <laughs> show. The second one is also a fun one, and that is Monument Valley Iris Society Show, Saturday the 27th and 28th, out at Panhandle Research and Extension Center. Beautiful iris display there. And the third one uh, tonight is our produce from the heart, donating your extra produce in our own garden every Tuesday through September, starting in June if you've got it, or even now, 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. So a uh, very good, very good uh, way to get rid of your extra produce. <laughs> All right, so questions next, gang. This is a Nebraska City viewer, Jonathan. Uh, roses in the landscape bed. Every year something eats small holes in the rose leaves. I think we maybe already talked about this one I tonight with the might. rose slug. Uh, if you watched earlier in the program, we were talking about the rose slug. It's the little caterpillar kind of looking thing, lime green, reddish head, and they do chew through the leaf and make those small holes. <clears throat> so a spinosad application will take care of those for you. All right, um, Matt, this is a Syracuse viewer, wants to know whether using a fertilizer plus pre-emerge, so the combination yeah. product. She wants to compost the clippings, and it has rained since she applied it. She likes to use the clippings to control weeds in her garden. I would say if you're gonna compost the clippings after a pre-emerge in herbicide, you just have to realize that there still might be some of that active ingredient in the compost. So just be careful of where you put them. I wouldn't put them maybe next to vegetables that you're gonna be eating, just because some of that might be getting down there, unless it's a product that's labeled for, for those areas. All right, thank you, Matt. Amy, um, this viewer has a, an oak 20 years ago planted. And the base of the tree, the bark appears as though it's rotting. She was thinking she would seal that with paint or something. Do you want to say no, no, no again? No, 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 do not touch it. <laughs> um, <laughs> you might want to check the integrity of the tree, though. Um, that If you're getting that rot down there, I would be really concerned with a major storm coming through that that oak would fall down. So check integrity, uh, have an arborist come out and take a look at it. All right, uh, Elizabeth, this is a Malcolm viewer. They have a 14 foot ginkgo, three inch diameter trunk. The leaves are curling down. Wondering is this herbicide, she says top to bottom leaves are affected or could it be something else? Do we know how long it's been in the spot? Well, 14 feet, it's probably been quite a while. More than likely, we're looking at herbicide injury. Again, with those um, cool nights and then we got into those warm temperatures, we're probably looking at volatilization. Um, again, like we talked about with the magnolia, nothing we can really do about it. It's just gonna be a wait and see type of a thing. If it does happen to push new leaves, they should be normal um, in shape for a ginkgo. Um, and so those are some things to look at and just make sure that it has adequate amount of moisture. If it's in an irrigated lawn situation, um, it should be fine. No need to apply extra fertilizer to any of those trees that have been affected by um, herbicide injury. We don't wanna stress, add fertilizer to a stress plant. All right, um, Jonathan, we have a little bit of time left. An Rough. Omaha viewer has a dwarf Alberta spruce with mites, probably spider mites. Mm -hmm. Is there any control other than chemical? Oh, other than chemical, other call than me at the Omaha office and we can discuss <laughs> some of those other options because I would have recommended bifenthrin off the cuff in the short amount of time that we have. But if you want to talk about other options, call me at the Omaha Extension office and we can discuss them. Strong stream of water. Yeah, that's, Strong that's a good one. Strong stream of water. Yeah. Shoot those Get little bugger dogs. Pressure washer. <laughs> yeah, that there you go. Yeah, All right, <laughs> one more quick question, to the, and I mean quick, to this end. Crushed eggshells applied to a lawn does away with grubs. No. <laughs> Try it and we'll see. I guess. Uh, we'll yeah. see. Let me know. <laughs> Raccoon. There we go. South Lake <laughs> Research Project for me. Well, that was a lot of fun and a lot of motion going on. <laughs>